I'm really happy to introduce Tim Graham. Uh, Tim Graham is a researcher in Moab, Utah. He is a PhD in ecology um, and is an ecologist that primarily studies insects and other arthropods um, or entomology. So he's currently studying the pollinators of the La LaSalle Mountains near Utah and is always looking for volunteers to help him sort bugs. So if you're in the Moab area or anywhere nearby, um, definitely reach out and we can connect you to uh, Tim. So without further ado, I'll let you take it away there, Tim. All right. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everybody. Um, looks like quite a crowd. Um, I'm going to just jump right into the slideshow and um, I'll talk. Um, I don't know how long it'll take, but hopefully not too long. And uh, just give you some what I want to do is, is talk about the diversity of invertebrates, um, insects in particular, and, uh, and why they're important in the world. And uh, then um, if there's time, we can go into some of the specific um, projects that I work on. Um, um, there, I'll give you time for questions and We'll go from there. So with that, I will share the screen. So uncharismatic microfauna, the little things that run the world. Um, the uncharismatic microfauna comes from my time working for the National Park Service, where there is typically um, a strong influence on the charismatic megafauna, the big hairy things that people like to go see, like elk and moose and bison and bears and so on. Um, and so um, I work, I decided to say that I work on the uncharismatic microfauna, even though I don't find them uncharismatic. Um, the Little Things That Run the World is a quote from E.O. Wilson, another um, insect ecologist. And uh, he has been emphasizing the importance of um, insects and other invertebrates for a long time. So um, what are invertebrates? Um, they are those things that don't have a backbone. Um, these are some of the smaller ones, um, nematodes, rotifers, tardigrades, water bears uh, is another name for tardigrade. Um, and they're uh, often ignored, overlooked, um, but it turns out that, that um, there are some things that we can do or that we have learned to do um, based on um, studying some of these uh, little critters. And um, for instance, nematodes, rotifers, and tardigrades are um, able to dry up almost completely. They can lose up to about 92 to 95 percent of the water in their cells and then um, hang out in that dry state for a while, um, in some cases, maybe decades. And then when they get wet again, they come back to life. Um, so this is part of a little pothole. And the, all of that orange that you see are dried up rotifers and nematodes and tardigrades. And so they can build up large concentrations um, in little pools that most people probably don't recognize as being ecosystems at all. Um, and when water flows back into that little pool, then it will, they will um, turn back on. And we've been able to figure out how they do it and to take advantage of that um, for our own uses. So um, they dry up, all their proteins are preserved and um, functional once they get wet again. And we have things that we like to, um, would like to be able to store for long periods of time, like antibiotics, blood, other proteins. And we can apply the same mechanisms after studying these critters to those substances and then um, store them as dry, stable materials um, without having to give them any kind of special treatment um, as opposed to if we had to keep them wet, we might have to refrigerate them, it might be difficult to transport them and so on. So um, even though 
Um, these little guys aren't very big. Um, they um, can produce um, some important information for us. Um, and these are some of my favorite critters um, from potholes. Those of you that know me know that I like to, to study potholes. And these uh, crustaceans, tadpole shrimp, clam shrimp, fairy shrimp, um, have that same uh, method of surviving the dry period in their potholes. We call it cryptobiosis. Crypto means hidden, biosis means life, and there's so little activity going on that we can't measure oxygen consumption or heat production or carbon dioxide production. Um, in the case of the crustaceans, the egg sacs, the eggs are the, the part that stays um, viable, that dries up and uh, the adults dry and die when the, when the pool dries up. Um, just gonna quickly run through some of the variety of invertebrates, mostly arthropods, that's mostly what I deal with. Um, centipedes, um, we have some nice big ones here that can um, eat large, other large uh, arthropods, insects that might be causing trouble in your garden or so on. Um, same with the wind scorpions and scorpions. Um, and this is um, one of my other little favorites, Sclerobunus robustus. It's a related to um, daddy long legs, the um, big long legged spider oid looking things are in a different order. Um, these guys live under uh, rotting logs up in the LaSalle's and in various other parts of the country. Um, I think one potential function for them is to star in an arachnophobia movie. If you, um, you know, magnified them maybe 30, 40 times, um, they can be pretty scary looking. As it is, they're only about three or four millimeters long. Um, I'm gonna give you just a quick little movie of some of them that I brought home a couple days ago. So hope you're not too creeped out, but I find them fascinating. One interesting thing is that often when you turn the log over, they're upside down on the bottom of the log, they're not on the ground. So I don't know if they spend a lot of time upside down or if that just happens to be that they quickly grab onto the log as it's being moved. Spiders, um, lots and lots of different kinds of spiders. Um, we have orb weavers, uh, like down here in the lower right, um, making those nice webs, Charlotte web, Charlotte's web. Um, and then others that, that tend not to make uh, webs to hunt with, but are um, uh, what's known as cursorial. They're uh, cruising around looking for um, movement and that movement usually translates into food. Um, most of the diversity of invertebrates uh, is in the insects. And so lots and lots of different kinds of insects, ants, flies, um, lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, different kinds of beetles, um, true bugs, dragonflies and damselflies, Hymenoptera, the wasps and bees. Um, so we'll concentrate a little bit on the insects. Um, now, life history of insects, they have two basic um, forms of, of life cycles. One is incomplete metamorphosis. Um, the true bugs, all of which are represented here, the back swimmer, um, this is a little plant bug, leaf-legged bug, and cone-nose kissing bug. Um, the adult female lays eggs, the eggs hatch, and they look basically like the adult, except they don't have wings yet. So this is a, a nymph. Um, the other three have wings, and so they're adults. Um, the nymphs feed, do pretty much the same thing that the adults do, so they have the same ecology. Um, and then, as they grow, they molt and 
each molt, um, their wings develop a little bit more until they're an adult. They molt into the adult form. They have functional wings so they can fly and, uh, and then they mate and so on. Um, but the ecology of these groups is basically the same for the immature form and the adult form. Um, Orthoptera are one of the um, big groups that, that exercise this. Um, one way that they might uh, change their ecology a little bit, this black one in the middle looks like an ant, but it's actually a katydid similar to the green uh, leaf mimic here on the wall. Um, as a nymph, it looks like an ant. Um, I don't know the ecology of this thing. It's a tropical katydid, um, but it um, is likely still uh, primarily a, a leaf feeding, leaf chewing insect, but um, things that look like ants are often avoided by other um, organisms because ants can be um, kind of nasty. Um, termites are another group that have um, incomplete metamorphosis. We think of them as being like ants, but they're actually um, a much more primitive group. Um, and uh, so they uh, move through nymphal stages and then um, the workers are mature, but um, only the alates, the queens and, and males have wings. In complete metamorphosis, there are four stages. So you start off with eggs. These are from a lacewing. Um, the eggs hatch and they have a larval form like this moth. Um, and that larva is typically very different from the adult uh, and is doing different things. So in the case of, of something like this larva, um, the larva is uh, maybe feeding on roots and so on down in the, in the soil. Um, and then when it becomes an adult, it is feeding on nectar and um, or may not be feeding at all. Often, um, especially in the, in the um, complete metamorphosis group, there are insects that, that don't feed as adults. Their function as an adult is, is merely reproduction. So um, you have eggs and then larva and then pupal cases, pupate. Um, so the cocoons of moths and chrysalis of butterflies. Um, this is the pupal case of the splendid tamarisk beetle, uh, or sorry, uh, tamarisk weevil. It's a weevil, you can see the little snout on it. And um, it's a, a beetle that was introduced um, maybe by accident, maybe somebody did it on purpose. Uh, we don't really know the history of it, but it showed up in the Southwest about uh, seven or eight years ago. And it does feed on tamarisk and feeds only on tamarisk. Um, and it makes this nice little um, kind of lacy pupil case. And then um, when it's ready to become an, an adult, then it emerges from that. And um, all of those forms feed on tamarisk. So in that case, the ecology of the larva and the adult are not different. Um, but in the case of many of the others, um, you might have a predatory adult beetle and an herbivorous root feeding um, larval phase and so on. So just more beetles. There are lots and lots of beetles uh, in the world. Here's a big grub, a beetle larva, probably of a scarab. Um, this happened to be in Australia, so it's not related to the beetles that I have shown as adults, um, which all are found in the Southwest. Um, but you can see a very different form between the adults and the larva. And um, so that allows the species to occupy essentially two niches. And um, so they aren't competing with each other and that enables them to, to uh, be more successful reproductively. Flies are another group with the uh, um, complete metamorphosis. These two photos are the pupil case 
of a robber fly that emerged um, in my backyard one day. Um, and flies are a very diverse group. They uh, occupy a lot of different uh, habitats and perform a lot of different functions. Um, the robber flies in the, in the soil as a, as a larva are probably predatory on, on other soil dwelling organisms. The adult is also predatory, but probably feeding on very different things. Um, although it may be feeding on the adults of the larva that, that its larva is feeding on. Um, this is a tachinid fly. Uh, it's, you can see down here under the eyes and, and by the front wing, front legs, um, there's a lot of yellow and that's pollen. So the adult is feeding on nectar, um, carrying pollen from flower to flower. So it's a good pollinator. The larva are probably living in the soil or maybe in um, aquatic habitats um, doing something very different. Um, Lepidoptera, uh, butterflies and moths. Uh, we all know caterpillars look different from their adults. Um, this caterpillar uh, belongs to these two um, adults. So this is uh, Rocky Mountain Parnassian, um, a pretty uh, butterfly. It's related to the swallowtails, and the adult or the uh, caterpillar is feeding on um, this little succulent. It's a sedum, which um, is related to many of the succulent uh, garden plants that, that people grow as ornamentals. Um, but it's an herbivore. The adults are pollinating, feeding on nectar, and um, probably not actually feeding on pollen, but um, moving pollen. This caterpillar is also from up in the La Salle's, but I don't know what the adult looks like. And the Hymenoptera um, are represented by a lot of different critters, the ants in particular that um, occupy a very uh, dominant role in a lot of ecosystems. They're predators, herbivores, detritivores. Um, they grow uh, fungi and, and they feed on lots of different things. Um, and we all, probably have some positive and some negative uh, memories of interactions with ants. So um, I've touched a little bit on, on why they're important. Um, the different functions, insects actually perform almost every ecological function except for photosynthesis. So and we have pollinators, um, which move um, pollen from one flower to another, enabling um, the plants to reproduce. Um, and we see a lot of that and there's a lot of diversity. This is um, one of the interesting species that's on the Colorado Plateau. It's a bee that bores into the rock, into relatively soft sandstone and makes its nests in the rock itself. Um, you can see on this Bombus morris and I, this is the big, um, pollen sac on its hind leg. Um, these bumblebees are males. They're um, getting ready to spend the night in that nice, warm, fuzzy uh, thistle head, flower head. And these three bees have just spent the night and haven't woken up yet in a desert poppy out in the San Rafael Desert. Um, I'm going to play this little movie. It's um, a bumblebee up in those saws feeding on a composite. And you can see it's probing into um, each flower. Remember a composite, each one of these petal looking things is a flower and each of the um, what are called disc flowers, each of those little structures is a separate flower. Um, if you notice there's no pollen on the hind leg, that's because this is a, a cuckoo bumblebee. It's a parasitic bee that lays its eggs in the nests of other bumblebees and uh, lets them rear its, its young. So it only needs to gather energy uh, from the nectar. It doesn't need to collect pollen to feed its, its own larva. One interesting thing um, I didn't notice when I shot this, but you can see here is an ant that's 
moving up onto the to the plant um, oops, to um, to forage on that on that same plant. Um, a lot of insects are herbivores, and one of the insects that I study are um, is the tamarisk leaf beetle. You can see sometimes they aggregate in extremely high uh, numbers. And these two photos were taken three years apart um, from the same place along the Potash Road. And so you can see a tamarisk beetle um, does a pretty good job of defoliating tamarisk. Um, this, uh, both photos were taken in August. That green in the background is also tamarisk. So um, it's not like this is January. Um, Herbivores, um, invertebrates as herbivores move an awful lot of biomass. And uh, one of the most important things that they do is they convert plant biomass, which is based on carbon, to animal biomass, which is based on nitrogen. And thus that productivity of plants, um, which is converting solar energy to chemical energy and is the basis of most of uh, life on earth, um, once it's converted to animal energy, then it's, or animal biomass, it's much more available to other organisms. And so um, without insects feeding, then um, it would be a, a much less diverse place in general because um, digesting plant material is difficult. Um, cellulose and lignin are not digestible by most organisms, most animals. And, um, there's not a lot of nitrogen in those plants and, and animal biomass is based on nitrogen. Uh, and so we need to, to have these little converters, um, insects and other detri other um, herbivores. And then detritivores, they um, are the things that clean up the world. Um, everything dies. And if there weren't things feeding on the dead stuff, then um, we would be inundated by dead plants, dead animals, and so on. And um, even without considering the recycling of the nutrients that are um, in these organisms, uh, we would be overwhelmed by all the dead stuff soon. And, and so it's nice to have some things that, that move that stuff um, back into the system in a way that, there, that other organisms can use it. Um, and this, so here's a camel cricket, another one of my favorite study animals. He's hauling, a, or she is hauling a rabbit pellet. Um, and you can see a little bit back here, the track of the pellet being dragged. She'll take it back to her burrow and, um, sit down in the burrow, maybe for a day, maybe for longer, we don't really know, but um, they provision their burrows with um, live plant material, dead plant material, um, feces from other animals. Uh, you saw um, in the previous slide, the uh, camel cricket feeding on the Jerusalem cricket. Um, I've also seen Jerusalem crickets feeding on the camel cricket, so turnabout is fair play. Um, this is an interesting situation. We had a pitfall traps, a big Jerusalem cricket fell in. Um, it was in the trap for about three days and had started to decompose and the carrion beetles were attracted to that odor. And so they all came and fell in some flies that feed on, um, dead organisms as well. Um, this, uh, is a piece of candy that somebody dropped on the sidewalk and the ants have been cleaning it up. Um, my guess is the candy fell and got rolled in the, in the bark. The ants have eaten enough of it that the bark has fallen away. And uh, so they're in the process of moving that back into um, the food chain. Invertebrates are prey, both for other invertebrates and for vertebrates. So a grasshopper being eaten by a lizard, a uh, stink bug being eaten by a scorpion. Um, so those things, again, um, grasshoppers and stink bugs are herbivores. 
they feed on plants. And so that biomass is now being converted into um, animal biomass and can move through the ecosystem more easily. And there are lots of predators, um, ant lions, a back swimmer eating a fairy shrimp, ladybugs, robber flies. Um, I have a friend who was always threatening to make a t-shirt about the prairie dogs that are seen um, out on the highway. One gets run over, another prairie dog or two run out there. Um, some people think that they're going out to try to help that prairie dog off the road, but really they are going to help it off the road one bite at a time. Um, and he wanted to make a, a t-shirt that said, prairie dog restaurant, we eat our own. Well, robber flies do the same. Uh, so here's a robber fly feeding on another robber fly. And there are parasites. Um, this fly is trying to parasitize this hornworm. This is on Datura, uh, which is in the same family as tomatoes. Um, and the fly would fly down under the leaf and the hornworm would whip its head around and try to keep the fly from being able to land on it. And um, who knows, I didn't stay around long enough to, to see who won that battle, but probably the parasite eventually got some eggs in there. Um, this is a bee, and this isn't the, actually the parasite, but this is a colonial bee, and um, there are um, a number of animals that parasitize these bees, including velvet ants, which is um, a wingless wasp. And um, so you can find those, those um, parasites. And then this is my arm last summer in the Lasalles. There are only 14 mosquitoes on me. <coughs> but um, so um, they are parasites of vertebrates and invertebrates. And then there are also hosts of um, parasites as well. So this is an interesting um, story. Um, Jerusalem crickets <coughs> and other um, <coughs> organisms are um, uh, detritivores. They feed on dead organic material like other insects. They might consume the egg of a Gordian worm or a horsehair worm, it's also called as. And when that worm egg is in the right host, then it will hatch out, live in the abdomen of the insect and feed off of that insect, parasitizing it. If it's not the right host, then it, it forms a cyst and goes dormant. And then when that insect dies, then maybe a detritivore like the Jerusalem cricket or the darkling beetles, the big black um, beetles that people refer to as stink bugs, um, they feed on dead, uh, lots of dead organic material. And so they might consume that insect. Then they're the right host. And so then the cyst will um, become active. When that parasite, the Gordian worm is ready to become an adult, then it um, starts to, to break through the body wall, but it doesn't actually emerge until the insect goes into water. The adults are free living aquatic organisms. The parasite, the larva are the um, parasitic form. And so um, how do they know whether this insect is going to go to water or not? Well, it turns out that that um, they make it go to water. Um, and there were a number of hypotheses about how that could happen. Um, but it looks like um, they've recently isolated proteins in the Gordian worm that are exactly the same as proteins that are in the brain of, of regular field crickets, the black crickets that keep you awake at night. And and those crickets are a good host for the Gordian worm. And so it's, uh, it appears that the, that the Gordian worm um, is sending signals to the, to the host 
telling it to go to water and then the host falls in the water and then the, the Gordian worm can emerge. Um, this particular uh, Jerusalem cricket was fell into a pitfall trap of mine that we had set up for amphibians. And so we had a little water in the, in the bottom of the bucket. And so when the Jerusalem cricket hit the water, the Gordian worm started to emerge and they both had the, the bad luck of being in a place where somebody like me that likes to collect invertebrates um, would encounter them. And so they're now preserved specimens in my collection. So what do invertebrates do to survive, um, especially all those things that would like to eat them? So um, a lot of them use camouflage. Um, I don't know if you can see the the grasshopper. You can see it in the insect. Can you see it in the larger photo? I can only see two heads, but I see one nodding. <laughs> It's down here next to the rock. And these things are really amazing. If you look closely at the, at the inset, even the, the eye, they have a compound eye, and so they're multifaceted, but the eye is speckled just like sand grains. And the legs, the wings, everything um, are very closely mimicking the, the sand grains that it sits on. Um, this grasshopper, um, likes to sit on bare ground, on bare sand. Others like to sit on plants and they <clears throat> use different kinds of, of um, camouflage. Some use a strong defense, like this is the darkling beetle I was talking about. It's shooting that nasty smell up into the air because it got bothered. Here's the velvet ant. Um, and this is a milkweed beetle. And so this is aposematic coloration. It's warning coloration. Um, the orange or yellow on black um, is a very common um, theme for warning here in the milkweed beetle. You can see black and red. Um, and so um, they might, it might mean that, that that is not a tasty organism, um, feeding on milkweed, then you have um, the milkweed toxins incorporated into your body and it might just taste bad. It might actually um, cause you to be ill and in some cases it can kill the predator um, depending on what the plant is that, that they are um, sequestering toxins from. The velvet ants have a very nasty sting. Um, the common name for one particular particularly large uh, velvet ant is the cow killer because its sting is so bad that they um, uh, think that it could kill a cow if, you, if, if it were to sting it. Probably not quite that bad, but um, can be pretty painful. And then some just um, try to jump, try to get away. Um, these are a bunch of Mormon crickets and you can see this in the inset down here. <clears throat> this guy um, is jumping. Probably he doesn't know where he's going. Um, and so it's hard for a predator to know where he's gonna land and where to try to catch him. Um, that particular individual is up here in this photo. The other thing that, that a group like Mormon crickets take advantage of is, is called predator satiation. There are so many of them that um, the chances are some of them will escape and the population will continue um, even though a lot of them might be eaten. <clears throat> and then um, mimicry. Um, we know that there are a lot of organisms that mimic things that taste bad, have bad stings, and so on. Um, I should put a question mark on this one in particular because we don't know if this is a mimicry situation or not, but um, I mentioned this camel cricket, the sand trotter that I, that I study. Um, it's active in the mornings as an adult. It's bright black. It's on this um, sand, uh, lives on active sand dunes, so mostly bare sand. So it's a very apparent organism, um, but it's also extremely abundant. 
And so it may um, take advantage of that predator satiation to some extent, but um, there's some speculation that it may resemble the tenebrionid beetles enough that, that predators avoid it. Um, one of these days, I'm going to um, bring some crickets and tenebrionids to somebody that has chickens and see if we can maybe test that hypothesis. Okay, so Audrey asks, where do I store all of these specimens? Um, a lot of them are temporarily stored um, at my house or in my storage unit. They're in alcohol, um, so they're um, relatively stable and preserved. Um, ultimately, um, the plan is for most of them, if not all of them, to end up in museums. Um, those that are that are, um, uh, even if they're not really good quality specimens for a display, um, they're useful for um, study in that, in that sort of black box behind the wall um, of the display areas in museums where people are looking for, um, looking to compare specimens from different places to see if they're the same species, to see if there are changes in relation to um, changes in the environment, um, whether something like climate change or something like um, changes in management of an area, um, that sort of thing. Um, but I have a lot of, as Kate mentioned at the beginning, I have a lot of samples that um, still need to be processed. I showed you that picture of the Jerusalem cricket and the carrion beetles in the pitfall trap. Um, that was one version of, of the pitfall traps that I use for different studies. Um, and those are just passive open traps. Uh, whatever walks into them uh, stays in there. And I have lots of those uh, from the LaSalle's right now um, that still need to be sorted. Uh, and then um, some of the, of the specimens, the bees, um, Kate mentioned that I'm working on pollinators in the LaSalle's, the bees will go to um, Utah State University, uh, USDA bee lab up there. They have a pollinator research group. Um, most of the other specimens will probably end up in the Natural History Museum of Utah. Um, a lot of the arachnids, the spiders and um, opelionids and so on, the uh, harvestmen will go to uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, probably um, the collections manager there for invertebrates is a spider expert. I have a question. Um, yes. uh, are there any uh, species that are particularly endangered that we should know about in Utah? Um, and is there anything that we can do to go about protecting some of these species? Um, the answer is yes, but um, it's mostly a guess yes, um, because we don't know very much. The work I'm doing in the LaSalle's is basically a baseline inventory, trying to find out what is there. And, um, and there are a few places in Utah where we know a lot about the invertebrates. Um, there are a few species um, that are um, known to be rare. There's a tiger beetle that's found only on the coral pink sand dunes down by Kanab. So it's um, endemic to just that small area. And um, it's, so it doesn't have a lot of habitat, and a lot of that habitat is um, sand that people like to play on, um, either on their feet or on their um, motorized vehicles or whatever. And so the Coral Pink Sand Dunes State Park has been set aside in part to protect those, um, those tiger beetles. Um, there are species that, um, might be rare. Um, I have did pitfall trapping up in the LaSalle's for three years and one pitfall trap um, held a scorpion. And it's in a genus that 
previously there was one species known for Utah at low elevation, so it's um, quite possible that it will be a new species, an undescribed species. Um, and um, having quite a few pitfall traps out over three years in three different areas in the LaSalle's and getting one scorpion is um, an indication that they are certainly they're rare on the surface um, and and aren't wandering around a lot to fall into to my traps. Um, again, you know, we don't know anything about this this organism. Um, there are other species that are um, they can be very abundant. Um, invertebrates have tremendous reproductive capability, but if their habitats are at risk, even if it's a lot of habitat, then they could be at risk. So it's kind of a long answer. If anyone else has any questions, you can feel free to type them into the chat box. Okay, well, we'll leave the um, webinar open for just a little bit then if nobody else has any more questions. Um, I'm gonna launch a poll. Um, so if you please answer this poll, it would really help us with our um, funding for these types of webinars and other things like that. So um, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, I really appreciate you talking to us about the diversity of insects and other little, little critters um oh somebody has a question um they said how would you determine if the species was previously undescribed and how would you go about describing it uh, question well um so you uh, for invertebrates for insects and, and other uh, little critters a lot of times it's really difficult to determine that because um the the process is that somebody an expert in that in that group will um, describe it and publish a paper but often those papers get published in fairly obscure journals um, if you don't um, know about that group then you might not know how to get a hold of the journal and so on and some of the species were described back in the 1800s early 1900s and and that's the last time anyone's really looked at at whether this organism in southern Utah is the same as as an organism in northern New Mexico or something like that. Um, but um, ordinarily, you would be able to identify it to um, order uh, for the insects. The orders are things like grasshoppers and crickets, beetles butterflies and moths, those are each in different orders. And then um, you can usually find um, taxonomic keys that you can uh, track the family. And then from there, you will try to contact um, experts that work on those particular groups. Um, one of the problems that we have in ecology, taxonomy, um, these days is that there is less interest in becoming a taxonomist than there used to be. Um, there's a lot less funding than there used to be. And so um, the experts are getting older and older. And for some groups, there's no one living that is really an expert anymore um, because those people have passed on. Um, with DNA and so on, um, eventually we can probably um, get to a point where we can look at DNA and determine whether it's a different species or not. Um, but mostly you try to find an expert and send it to them. Um, in terms of describing a species, uh, for the most part, so, um, I'll just tell you, I have a mite that's named after me that I discovered here on the Colorado Plateau 
And if you'd like, I can show you a movie of it. Um, be coming active. But um, people ask, well, did you name it? And I didn't want to name it because you have to learn all the taxonomy about that organism and about that group. And I'd rather do the ecology part, not the, well, it has legs that are three times as long as, as its nearest relative or whatever. Um, and so you try to get it to an expert who already knows all of that stuff and then can put that in context. This organism is different because it differs from all of these known species in these ways. And for me, I would have had to, you know, go get another PhD in, in mite ecology or mite taxonomy if I were going to name it. So um, to, to name it, you send it to somebody else. Somebody else um, sent a question. It says, how do these critters control their temps in extreme conditions? And also Audrey asks, will the tamarisk, when will the tamarisk beetles be done killing all the tamarisk? And also I want you to show the mite movie, so. Okay, so um, tell me the first one again. The first, the first one is, how do these critters control their temperatures yeah. in extreme conditions? Okay, so um, there are, because they're mostly small, then they can avoid conditions that they don't, that they um, can't withstand for the most part. So um, like that sclerobonus, the little um, uh, spider relative, daddy long legs relative, um, you find them under logs that are, that are more or less half buried in the duff um, if the log is sitting on the surface fairly loosely, then it dries out under the log and, and it's inappropriate habitat for them. And so, you know, when I'm searching for them, I wander around in the forest and, and, and assess based on, on where I found them in the past, you know, that's a good place. That's a bad place. Um, in terms of overwintering, most of these organisms will move down into the soil to some extent where they're less likely to freeze. A lot of them are capable of, of withstanding some freezing um, or I should say some freezing temperatures, low temperatures. Um, they may or may not actually freeze because a lot of organisms produce um, sugars and other solutes to make their cell contents um, saltier or sweeter, which lowers the freezing temperature for that solution. And so they may not actually freeze, even though they get below the freezing temperature of pure water. Um, and hot temperatures, they do the same. They have to avoid those for the most part. So, and they can, um, organisms can be nocturnal and come out when it's cooler and forage and then get into those hiding places during the day. Um, those black camel crickets that I showed you, um, they're living on these bare sand dunes. Um, they come out just about the time the sun comes up. They're active for about three or four hours at the most and then they burrow down into the soil, into the sand. And I've excavated burrows that go down 45, 50 centimeters, uh, straight down, they go at an angle. And so they're actually burrowing for 75 to 80 centimeters, almost three feet uh, down into the sand. Um, so tamarisk beetles will never be done killing tamarisk. Um, they don't kill all the tamarisk where they are native. And so they are reducing the abundant food source that they had when they first got here and their populations have declined and the population of tamarisk has also declined. And so um, I think it's safe to say that already tamarisk is not a dominant force in riparian ecosystems anymore. Um, if you look along the river, yes, there are some tamarisk. Yes, some of them are green. Um, a lot of dead branches and all of that dead uh, canopy has exposed 
um, areas that can be colonized by other things. And there's a lot of willow moving in, um, the uh, skunk bush, uh, roost, and um, New Mexico privet, and so on. Um, in some cases, we have eliminated that problem of too much tamarisk, but there are other invasives waiting to dive into that empty space, Russian olive, Russian knapweed, um, kochia, and so on. So um, it's not the end to all of the struggles, but um, but it is um, addressing that one problem. Uh, so should I answer Abby's question or should I show the movie? I think we should do both, but okay. show the movie first and then the answer. Okay. So let's see. So this is an organism that lives in little tiny potholes. Some of them, maybe a half a liter of water will fill them up to overflowing. I just added water to the dry pothole and now I'm moving it, moving my microscope over a little bit to find some mites. Here are some mites right here. Um, for reference, 20 seconds ago, I put water into the pothole and you can see some movement in these mites already. Um, and so we'll just watch this for a little bit and you can see um, them become active again uh, in just a few seconds. So this is my mite. This is called Paraquanathrus grami. Um, and I found it um, a while back when I was studying potholes, um, working for the National Park Service. You can see now lots of movement in here. And they feed on those rotifers and nematodes that I was talking about. The mites use a different strategy to survive the dry periods. Um, they use what I call the Tupperware strategy. So they seal up and they stay wet inside. And so they're able to start functioning as soon as there's water available. The nematodes, the rotifers, tardigrades, they take five to 15 minutes to become active. And we think that during that time period, the mites are able to feed on them quite extensively. And so um, even though the nematodes and rotifers would last longer in a dry pothole, so long as it rains every couple of months, the mites are ready to go and they can feed um, and control those populations. That pothole that I showed you with the flakes of, of crust peeling up and the bright orange patches is a pool that doesn't have enough sediment in it for the mites to survive. And so the rotifers and nematodes can build up high enough populations that you can see their collective population um, with the naked eye. If you watch this long enough, which we probably won't today, but um, you would start to see little orange things moving around through the sand grains and, and swimming on the, in the water. And those are the nematodes and rotifers after they become active. So while we're watching this, I'll answer Abby's question. Um, the, actually the, the sclera bonus, um, that little harvestman critter um, was a surprise uh, to find. I, um, I found them first um, before this study, but I've been um, tracking them and, and they are uh, found as far up as as the Krumholtz trees, those stunted trees at, at the edge of the uh, true alpine um, treeless zone. Um, and I had, um, I had found this one um, down by Warner Lake one time and then lost the specimen. And a few years later, 
uh, ran across an article describing this weird arachnid from the Cascade Range. Um, they were describing a new species up there and they had pictures and I thought, yeah, I, I think that's what I, what I saw, what I caught um, up in the LaSalle's. And so then I started looking again and sure enough, it's a different genus, but um, related to these species up in the, in the Cascades. Um, and then another thing that, that um, occurred this past summer, 2019, um, I caught two bumblebees, um, the species of uh, Bombus occidentalis, the Western bumblebee, which used to be a very common species across all of the West of North America, but um, is basically gone from uh, large parts of its range and, and uh, is becoming rare across most of its range. And um, in looking at, at museum specimens and records, the most recent record we have of those um, in the LaSalle's are from 1968. And so um, to find them again now um, was uh, quite a treat. Um, they are considered uh, sensitive at least in most land management agencies that suspect that there might be some on their uh, management areas um, have incorporated management to protect habitat and so on. Um, the Forest Service here um, had concluded that they probably weren't around anymore and so um, there's some work now going on to try to get the Forest Service to um, to consider protecting habitat. And one of the things that I need to do this summer um, will be to go up and um, try to survey more of the LaSalle's to see uh, if we can find them. I found, I had three study sites and I found one at each of two study sites. A friend of mine who works in that B lab I mentioned at Utah State University uh, with USDA, um, was up in 2018 catching bees with me and he hadn't gotten through his collection because he's all over the world collecting bees. Um, but when I was up there last fall, um, we went through all of those and he, it turned out, had caught one uh, Western bumblebee at the third of my study sites. And so it looks like um, there is a population up there. It's not very abundant. Um, but um, it was pretty pretty nice to to find that that this unusual uh, I don't know about rare but certainly uncommon species um, was back on the Lasalles. Awesome. So um, I guess the final question would just be if people are interested in getting in touch with you about, about potentially helping to sort. Um, or just helping you with your research, how is the best way for them to do that? Um, so my email address is Lazius, and we can post this someplace, but- yeah, I'll, it's, I'll put it into the chat. Then, okay, so. yeah. L-A-S-I-U-S-1-7 at Gmail. And just drop me a line, and I have a, a group email that I send out um, when I'm going to be sorting, um, I've been uh, up to each of my study sites once this year already, um, mostly just to see um, how it looked early because there wasn't much snow up there. Um, and so over the next few weeks and months, I will um, probably be visiting each of the sites a few times and I'll send out an email that um, says, if you want to join me, then let me know and we'll try to, to work out the timing. 